Coming up on Oakdale Update, we'll talk with our police department about workplace violence. We'll introduce you to a new business in the city, and we'll let you know about events happening in the city this summer. Stay tuned. Oakdale Update is straight ahead. Welcome to Oakdale Update. I'm your host, Frank Arcello. This is the City of Oakdale's news and information program about your community. Workplace violence is any act or threat of physical violence, harassment, intimidation, or other threatening disruptive behavior that occurs at a work site. It ranges from threats and verbal abuse to physical assaults and even homicide. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, of 4,679 fatal workplace injuries that occurred in the United States in 2014, 403 were workplace homicides. With me today to talk about workplace violence are officers Michelle Stark and Ryan Stewart from the Oakdale Police Department. Thanks for joining us on Oakdale Update today. Thanks, Frank. It's a gruesome you. subject, but we're going we're gonna to be okay. Right. All right, uh, Michelle and Ryan, give me a little background of yourself. Uh, officer Michelle Stark, I'm the Community Affairs Officer with the Oakdale Police Department. I've been involved in public safety for about 22 years, 17 of those with the City of Oakdale. Have you been in at Oakdale for 22 years? I've been with Oakdale for 17 years. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And Ryan? And Ryan Stewart. I'm also in the Community Affairs Division. Um, I've been with the department for about 11 years, doing the Community Affairs uh, Division for about a year and a half now. Okay. So. All right. So um, let's start out. In my opinion, maybe I'm missing something here, but uh, workplace violence seems to be happening more across the country than, I mean, and why is this? What do you think? Right. What, what's going on? Why Certainly is this? Certainly I think it definitely seems like that with all the national media attention and as well as the local media attention to workplace violence and situations that are occurring throughout the metro area. So uh, that with uh, social media, uh, there's a lot more information that can be shared and repeated. So certainly it does seem like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the numbers do show it. Do you think it's uh, the press? Do you think the press is is making a bigger deal out of this? I mean, it's it's news. There's no question about it. It's horrible news every time. Do you think the press is making a bigger deal out of it than they should? I definitely think that it uh, draws a lot of viewers because people are concerned about it, so they feel the need to watch it. And I know the news kind of feeds off that and puts more of it on the air. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's making more or making less, I can't tell you that. But it definitely seems to be televised more than a... A uh, cat stuck in a tree, that's for sure. I yes. Okay, do you think there's uh, more copycats too because of the, the coverage that everybody is getting I and mean, all the bad guys are getting? Do you think that it's more of a copycat thing? A lot of copycats, that, should we say? It may be, and it may be also with the some escalation of mental health and um, the deterioration, um, the return of people who uh, have seen some serious uh, action uh, overseas and returning maybe without the support systems mm -hmm. and um, resources that they need uh, to get that help that maybe eventually escalates and uh, turns into something that uh, isn't good intention at all. So. Okay, so who, what group or uh, workplace area is more vulnerable. Is there any, any, any in particular? I would say, um, you know, the broad community uh, is impacted by workplace violence, but certainly police officers, you know, um, we try to combat those issues. Uh, nurses, uh, from f factory workers and farmers and uh, <coughs> different areas of um, uh, social help and mental health assistance, uh, those locations uh, that see a lot of activity and a lot of traffic through their businesses mm -hmm. um, that may be accustomed to dealing with those situations but may escalate at times. Okay, uh, Ryan, who do you think um, uh, is most likely to be a workplace violent person? You know, somebody, uh, give me a profile of a workplace violent person. 
it's somebody that uh, it could be anybody in general. There's no like um, look that they're going to have. It's just going to be like their life outside <coughs> of work may be deteriorating. They may have undiagnosed mental health, um, financial issues, divorce. It kind of usually piles up on someone, and then they do this act as their last um, thought that they can take care of their problem. Um, there's really no, like, I can't say, like, if you see this person, they'd be a workplace violence, but the biggest thing we kind of preach with this is that you have to take into account the things you're seeing with your employees or your coworkers and uh, address those issues as they come up with their small items until it becomes a big item that turns into something that is unpreventable, or uh, not preventable, but uh, catastrophic, like a shooting or mm -hmm. um, something like that. Right. Now, I know there was a, I'm sorry, go ahead. And be aware of those triggers, you know, those major life events, you know, um, communicate with your employees, get to know them. Uh, you know, if there's a major change in their behavior, whether it's uh, appearance or they speak rhetoric that's unusual or not normal for them or the environment is a great, um, you know, something to recognize and, and those could be triggers. So kind of get to know your employees, have communication openly with them and if they're experiencing a major life event, uh, recognize that employee assistant programs, mm -hmm. um, maybe police contact so we can make referrals to social service organizations on their behalf and try to get them help before it escalates. Okay. Now you do see a lot of times uh, a person comes in and they just get fired and of course then they come back and go out to the car and get a gun and come back and mm -hmm. kill a lot of people. It's pretty hard to anticipate that I'm sure, right? And if, if they, okay let's ask this question, if, um, if an employer did see, I mean, he fired somebody and he could just see they were so agitated. Mm -hmm. uh, would he be wise to call the police at that stage? Or, you know, a lot of people don't like to call the police thinking that they'll be made looking pretty silly. Right. Yeah. I mean, that would be a time if you have some concerns about these other things we talked about that you know about that's going on in the employee's life before they get terminated. Um, you can always have us come out there and just stand by or just be in the area to be aware of it depending on the level of the situation, if it's something that you think is gonna happen, um, we'd rather be called and have nothing happen than respond after the fact and have to deal with the, the loss of life or serious injuries to people. Okay. And you have to remember it's just a police report, it's just a contact, it's just information at that point in time and not necessarily, it's, it's an avenue and those people can make those choices at that point. And maybe we do make contact with the person and offer them assistance and try to help them through it and just say, or you're not welcome here and we provide trespass notice or whatever. It's dependent on the employer and their uh, proactive measures and their policies and procedures mm -hmm. and their training. So having all that in place in advance of something uh, detrimental happening um, mm -hmm. is is good planning and, and good workplace management. Okay, now let me ask you this. In the last six months to a year, have you had calls like that? I guess you'd call them welfare calls or welfare checks or something like that? It's concerns about employees. Yes, yes. Is, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, it's and what do you... It's a pretty what, regular call that we get. It's normal for right. us to respond to those. Okay, and what do you do about it? When you come out and what do you do? It depends on, like I said, the severity of it. Um, most of the time they just want us to be aware and they, we never actually make contact with the person that's being terminated. Other other instance, they would have us actually uh, help escort them out of the building and uh, trespass them if it's been a continuing problem with the person or they know that there's more chance of something happening. Mm -hmm. So it kind of varies. I mean, sometimes we just are in the area and sometimes we're actually making contact with the person that's being terminated. And okay. their, behavior, okay. their behavior dictates it. Yeah. So um, it's not who they are or what they are or what they look like or anything like that. It's behavior based. And if the behavior matches uh, what's occurring, uh, then we have to take action. So what do you do if, uh, say that you come out and uh, you have a very agitated person and you just know nothing good's gonna come with this. So can you, uh, I don't wanna say arrest them, can you hold them or how, how do you work that? What's the legalities involved there? So it would be more of a de-escalation type of situation in that if someone's upset that we have no legal reason to arrest them, um, they're not suicidal or stuff like that, it'd be a, we would de-escalate them, remove them from the situation typically, um, and then we can work with them just trying to get them some help if it's not to the level that meets our criteria for like a placement on like a 72-hour hold. Um, yeah, most of the time we just use our 
communication, just kind of get them past the moment and uh, try and refer them to resources that can help them long term to get over it or move on. Okay, what sort of resources do you have available? Uh, like through Canvas Health, uh, they have people that speak with people and kind of work through tough times or help with medication issues to get them balanced. Um, Regions Hospital we use on a regular basis for the 72-hour holds. Um, that's just going, they go down there and get evaluated for 72 hours and uh, just make sure that they're not a harm to themselves or other before they leave there. So mm -hmm. um, that's our two local ones, I think, of any other ones. Emergency social services sometimes. Mm -hmm. So do you load them up in the police car and take them to these spots or how do you work that? It depends on yeah, the situation. A Seventy-two really. hour hold would be. A, yeah, we would take them down there. But uh, as far as the other resources we refer them to, we would just get them in contact with them. And as long as we're comfortable with how they're acting at the end of the situation, um, they usually just go on their way and then make appointments later on for the op open resources that are out there. Okay. So you do get professionals involved to keep. If they're, like you say, short of medicine or they haven't been taking their yep. medicine, that kind of thing. Yep. Okay. Well, now, uh, let's say that there's a, you get a call that there's a, uh, no, before you get the call, what should an employer do if there's a situation happening right now? I mean, somebody's there, right there with a gun or whatever, or screaming and hollering and being very aggressive. <laughs> what should the employer do? The employer or the employee? The employer, or, or mostly the employer, you know, in charge of the whole group here, or the employees too, I guess, the, the whole bunch of them, what should they be doing? So certainly, first of all, is making sure that they have their policies and procedures in place and planning with their employees so they know what to do, okay? The best thing they can do is practice and role play, um, giving them the resources and training that we can assist them with and uh, provide that to their employees so they can recognize the workplace violence occurrence and then intercede and try to interrupt it. And initially, the employee would then try to de-escalate the situation um, and talk to the individual, try to uh, uh, get a handle on the situation and calm things down, remain calm themselves and move into a conversation. If that's not working um, with those tactics and that training that they've been provided, then they need to leave the scene uh, as quickly and as safely as possible. Dial 911. It may be possible that if a person is actively engaged and just determined to harm people, mm -hmm. you may have to take physical action, you know, and you just have to know that ahead of time. And you have to role play that because it's a difficult concept um, and it's something that you don't want to think about in a workplace mm -hmm. um, or in a school where you're supposed to feel safe. Sure. But you need to take that initiative, be assertive, be calm, and make that decision at that point. And with your training that your employer is assisting you with, um, you may have a plan to say, okay, if this happens, um, this is when I'm going to contact the police. Or you make a sign or a signal to a fellow employee, I'm in trouble, mm -hmm. dial 911. Mm -hmm. um, that there's some kind of communication that's going on uh, in the building or with your coworkers so that can alert people to trouble, make that phone call to police, and then flee if they need to, you know, evacuate. Okay, I'm thinking of, uh, okay, we can, <clears throat> a, a smaller organization, maybe 20 to 50 employees. Sure. They could do this, they could practice it and they could be aware of it. But what about a place like 3M or um, I don't know, some other larger spots? Do they, should they still role play this sure. and, and practice this? Absolutely. It's almost more important at the larger. What's that? Yeah. It's almost more important at the larger venues um, because at a smaller group, you guys know, everybody knows everybody. Um, in a larger facility, you'd have to go off your training on that. If someone says this, I may not work with this person every day, but I know that it's a serious incident and we move out of the building or whatever to mm -hmm. seek shelter at the location you're at. Mm -hmm. The biggest point to touch on is that if you don't practice or plan, if something happens, you're most likely going to freeze, and then you're just going to be a victim of the situation. Sure. So right. that's why we emphasize the practicing, the planning, and then it's all going to evolve very fast. You just have to make that action that you had planned to do, and it's easier for your mind to comprehend that when you're stressed under a high-stress situation. So. Mm -hmm. 
You know, sometimes I I think of what would I do if if it happened to me. Mm -hmm. I do think about it. You know, do it's I get under the table if it's in a restaurant? I'd get yep. under the table, or do I hit the deck, or mm -hmm. yep. run, or hide, or Exactly. And I understand, and I know run, hide, and fight, or fight are yep. three of the big things. And that's your mental preparedness. But I, I am prepared. <clears throat> I mean, and if I see someone shooting here, I'm going to go hit him in the back of the head with a chair or something. I don't know, you know. Something. You don't know, but I, yeah. I think about it. Yeah. And I think we should all do that, right? Yes. Um, you know, figure out a way to interrupt the situation, to top the situation, or maybe it's just to cause enough distraction to get you and others out of the building safely. Mm -hmm. So those are your options exactly. You choose to run, you choose to hide, and barricade yourselves with chairs or whatever in a room um, in an area of safety or fight. And, you know, and if it's an immediate threat and they're right in front of you, you may have to take that physical action. Mm -hmm. So we definitely uh, want you to be thinking about how you're going to go about that. And the only way to do it is planning. I, I, so, I think so. And, and again, like you say, in bigger spots, it's probably more important. Go ahead. And it's really depending on where the threat is. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if your threat is inside, you know, those communications, if you have a uh, network, uh, t an intercom system uh, within your building or a location, uh, having that planned out as well and what, what things you're going to say to acknowledge an emergency in your building. Um, or if it's an outside emergency, you know, what is your planning process? What are you going to do? Um, if the emergency is occurring outside the building. Mm -hmm. I think our school systems are pretty adept at this, aren't they? And yeah. They're the doing lockdown. well. I mean, mm -hmm. it seems like if there's a shooting a mile away, everybody locks down. They lock down mm -hmm. quite, they're, they're good at it, I think, aren't and they? they rehearse it quite often, so. Right. Oh, they rehearse it, yeah. well, they do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Now, there was, a, I brought this up before, there's an article in last Sunday's paper at Minneapolis Trib. The, last, the latest shooting out in California, the professor that got shot, one of the other professors, um, he, he, pl he locked the door, or he, he, he plugged up the door so that the guy couldn't get out into the hallway, and that's good. So they say he saved a lot of lives. But one of the things that was brought up is the people that were told to lock down, there's no locks on the doors. And I guess logistically, you can't have, every, every room can't be, have a lock on it, right? Mm -hmm. So what would you suggest if you don't have a lock on the door? And I mean a, a true lock. Mm -hmm. in, a, in a preparation thing, there is other stuff you can get besides a lock that go on the doors to secure them. But uh, in an event, if you're in a foreign area or something that you're not normally in, that you don't have control over the locks, I put anything that's heavy, file cabinet, work together with other people and just barricade the door. Um, there's always heavy objects in buildings, offices, schools. I mean, that's the best avenue to go because the lock may, or the person may have a key to the lock. Or I mean, there's a lot of options mm -hmm. there. So the, if there's a heavier object there, you're a harder target to get to, so they're going to move on and try and find other avenues to go. They're not going to sit there and mess with this door that's going to take them a half an hour to get through. So that's our avenue of protection is just as much as you can pile in front of that door, the better. Mm -hmm. And there's different resources, and you have to use your resources, whatever they may be. You what, know? Do you, what do you mean? What? So if you are in a lockdown situation and um, the perpetrator, the intruder actually um, breaches the area that you're in, search for different resources that are within your arm span. You know, maybe it's um, a scissors, maybe it's um, pencils, whatever. So at that point, you just have to uh, use as much initiative to protect yourself at that time. So What are the legalities mm -hmm. if I were to take a scissors and stab someone that's threatening me. I'm okay, right? I mean, I'm, no lawsuit should affect me. If your actions are reasonable and you're um, protecting yourself or someone else from physical harm, uh, great bodily harm or death, um, those are certainly personal decisions that you have to make and you have to know that ahead of time. But that's and, a tough one because... And know uh, the skin you're in and certainly we're not lawyers up here, but uh, you know, there is provision that you can use force against someone who is uh, ultimately har going to harm you. What would happen if I were, were being robbed and I took one of my scissors and I ran after the person as they ran out the door and I stabbed them? Would that be, what would be the legalities there, do you think? Well, you have a... You I have stabbed an, him in the back You know, after he robbed me. Depends on the reasonable 
mindfulness and the totality of the circumstances. Uh, however, um, you know, if it's an active shooter and they have uh, killed many people on scene or you've witnessed it, okay. you have to know that, mm -hmm. you know, going into it. And um, if you feel that your actions are reasonable to stop further injury of other people, um, then it would be up to a court, certainly, okay. uh, to make those decisions on but that's your a, actions. That's, that's a scary thought, though, isn't it? I mean, uh, it is. Okay. Anyway, all right. So let's move on now. Um, I had I mentioned to you before about SWAT team involvement. Mm -hmm. Now, where does this come about? When when would the SWAT teams be uh, brought in? You guys, sure. I know you people. You'll go to the. You'll be yeah. the first on the scene. Then what? Then where to go from there? If it's like an active shooter with active gunfire, the, the SWAT team will get called, but it's going to be the first responding officers would go in in teams and go towards the threat. And um, They're not going to wait for a SWAT team to get there. It could be half hour, an hour, an hour and a half, depending on the day, time of day and location. So it's going to be, the SWAT team is usually typically used for like a barricaded subject that there's no immediate threat to loss of life. Um, it's kind of more of a slow paced operation most of the time in an active shooter situation or like if someone, even if it's not shooting, if they're stabbing someone or like repeated that type of thing, it would be the first officers would go in and there wouldn't be many of them and then there'd be more coming and it would just be a wave of officers mm -hmm. coming in to secure the situation. I think uh, the Columbine incident well, four or five years ago, whatever that was, I think, I think police learned a big lesson on that one, didn't mm -hmm. they? Yeah. Right. Know, that when you get there, get inside, get in. right? Right. Yeah, that's that was a sad situation. Yep. A lot of deaths on kind of that, but uh, but you learned. You all mm -hmm. learned on that one. Um, now, you know, when I was reading some literature on this, it was mentioned robbery is considered a workplace violence. Absolutely. And and what what else would be uh, robberies and uh, um, just any kind of aggression? In right. A, domestic situations, you know, certainly if there's an order for protection um, that one of your employees may have, um, knowing that in advance, you know, having that comfort level for people be, to be able to share that, um, it's, a, it's a tough thing uh, to talk about something so personal, but, but you know, it'll be helpful uh, if your employer is aware of that. So that's for the employee and also to keep that open engagement on the employer side to say, yeah, please share that with me because we want you to be as safe as possible while you're at work mm -hmm. and share that information with us so we can help you be safe as well. So do you have a, a definite program so that if uh, Billy's uh, shop down here, he's got 50 employees and he wants to get some training mm -hmm. and have you come in, will you, are you, do you do that? Do you yep. come in? Certainly. And you do do yeah, that? Do that Absolutely. So uh, how long a process would that be? I mean, is it a day training or half a day, or how do you work that? We can typically make it to whatever time frame the business has. We have longer presentations, we have shorter ones that kind of highlight the major necessities versus the longer one kind of goes into more detail on the, the planning and evacuation stuff. And, and I suppose like it that. depends on the size of the, the yep. place too, right? Many that makes a difference. Presenting too. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so we're just about out of time, but who would give me some uh, telephone numbers and that they can contact if anybody's interested in uh, having their their business uh, checked out and and you, you do a seminar for them? Sure, certainly they can contact the Oakdale Police Department at 651-738-1025. <coughs> uh, just ask for Officer Stark or Officer Stewart, and we'll certainly get them the resources or the information uh, to the level of their needs. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Well, that is it, and we're out of time, but I want to thank you both for joining us today. I That's think we right. learned a lot, and I think we did a fine job, didn't okay. we? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. It's now time for our business spotlight segment. Each month, we profile a different business in our community. Here's this month's business. All the fun for only a fraction of the cost. That's the motto of Fractional Toys in Oakdale. Fractional Toys is about recreational uh, toys, obviously. I started to help people get outdoors for a fraction of the cost. That's where the name came from. Um, I came from a background of selling boats and just realized that when people purchase something, they always kind of wanted something else too. Fractional Toys gives year-round access to recreational vehicles such as boats, snowmobiles, and RVs. Customers can either rent them just once 
or become members and have access to even more benefits. There's been boat clubs forever. Um, there's been car clubs, this and that. And the, the, the one-off rentals is really um, a great way for us to earn someone's trust. You know, so they'll come in, they'll see our campers, they'll see how nice they are. Uh, they'll see some of the other stuff and they'll ask, hey, what's all this or whatnot? And then it's a good segue into the membership. Fractional Toys is located at 7500 Hudson Boulevard North in Oakdale. For more information, visit their website at FractionalToys.com. It's time for a short break. We'll be right back with more of Oakdale Update in just a minute. Welcome back to Oakdale Update. We just have a few minutes left, but before we go, here are a few helpful reminders. The City of Oakdale operates under a year-round odd-even watering schedule for lawns and gardens. Also, the feeding of wildlife and waterfowl is not allowed. Bird feeders are allowed, provided they are at least five feet above the ground or structure. And our final reminders this month have to do with getting rid of unwanted items. If you have books you'd like to donate, you can drop them off at the Oakdale Library on Heron Avenue North. Christmas lights and extension cords can be brought to City Hall to be recycled. You can also bring toys, puzzles, and games to City Hall as well. And finally, I want to remind you that the Farmer's Market returned earlier this month. The market runs from 2 to 6 p.m. in the North parking lot at Oakdale City Hall. The Farmer's Market runs every Wednesday until October 26th and is a great place to pick up a variety of fresh fruits, vegetables, a bouquet of flowers, a loaf of bread, dessert, and more. That's all we have time for this month on Oakdale Update. For everyone at the City of Oakdale, thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.